Unlike any other substance, PCBs are the living proof of the fact that once chemicals are released into the environment, they remain there for generations. When PCBs were first introduced in the 1920s, they were considered invaluable in electrical equipment, in buildings and in machinery. The chemicals are practically invisible and are not something ordinary people come in contact with. But a mere few generations later, PCBs had imperceptibly spread all over the world and are now to be found in both animal and human organisms as well as in foodstuffs. When in the 1970s it first became evident that PCBs were a health hazard, they were banned by most of the developed countries, but it was too late, for PCBs don't simply disappear. On the contrary, they continue to do harm to this very day. Now, in one lifespan, the future came rushing in like an avalanche. Here was power, unbelievably versatile power. Titanically muscle power, leaping to any task. Incredibly delicate power, responding with instant precision to the tiniest signal. With the birth of the electrical age, a nation's standard of living surged forward. The prevalence of electricity has been a key factor in industrialization, so its use as an energy form in most types of products has through time skyrocketed. And a certain group of chemical substances, PCB for one, because of its being a kind of liquid electric insulation, has played a significant role in the distribution of electricity. PCB, first commercially manufactured in 1927, is a syrupy, sticky substance. There definitely was the right time for this substance because we had learned how to generate electricity. We got the electric light bulb. Uh, we began to develop instruments and machines that uh, needed electricity. Transformers, generators on telephone poles all across the country. As the electricity came in, they loaded those things with PCBs. And we wouldn't have nationwide distribution of electricity uh, if it hadn't been for the PCBs. After the introduction of PCB, it was found to have many useful properties for a wide range of products. Not only for its resistance to thermal breakdown, but also because it could make other substances more pliable. Soon, the consumption of PCB quickly rose to several thousand tons. They were used as hydraulic fluids. They were added to paints, to ceiling tiles, to linoleum. They were used in carbonless paper in the days before the word processor, and many, many domestic uses. Basically, PCBs became that product that we introduced into practically everything where there was a possibility that this material would catch on fire. Any organic material is going to burn, but by putting PCBs into this organic material, it didn't flame up, it didn't burn, and it slowed down that process. They put it in the concrete, and then the, the materials that we're putting in our walls so our buildings wouldn't catch on fire. We've saved a lot of lives. We prevented a lot of fires because of the PCBs. They became very much a part of our lives. In the 1940s and 50s, when the chemical industry was prospering, many new products, such as nylons, plastic containers, fire extinguishing agents and pesticides were launched, along with a number of chemicals which soon began to leave their mark on daily life. But by the early 60s, some of these new chemical substances were suspected of contaminating both nature and, perhaps, people. One such substance was the insecticide DDT, which had been dispersed over cities and fields since the 1940s in order to combat diseases and vermin, resulting later in traces of it being found not only in various species of birds, but also in agricultural products such as eggs, milk, butter and meat. 
But when scientists began to trace DDT in humans, that wasn't all they found. I got the task to analyze the Swedes for DDT and found, of course, DDT. But I did more than that because in the chromatograms that showed the DDT, there were eight unknown peaks, each of them representing one substance. But we did not know what it was. At Stockholm's Museum of Natural History, eagle feathers have been collected since 1888. When Søren Jensen began examining them, he found that from 1942 onward, there was a particular chemical which peaked, but which wasn't DDT. And when, after two years' research, Søren Jensen found excessively large concentrations of these chemicals in a dead white-tailed eagle, he managed to isolate and identify the unknown substances as being PCB and discovered them in some rather unexpected places. Just for curiosity, I analyzed my own hair, my wife's hair and all the kids. And it turned up that I had the highest level, my wife also very high. And among the children, the youngest still breastfeeding had the highest level of both PCB and DDT. I think that many societies got more or less a shock because in the past you have learned that DDT was spread onto the vegetation to uh, fight against uh, insects and so. But uh, all knowledge about DD, uh, PCB was that it was used in closed system. And how could it come out then? Because half a year after the discovery, it was found all over the world. PCBs had apparently leaked from machines, buildings and electrical appliances into the environment. And as became evident, PCB, just like DDT, is accumulated in the food chain right from minute quantities in microorganisms and small herbivores to quantities millions of times higher at the top of the food chain, in carnivores and humans. It was, however, as yet still not widely acknowledged that PCBs were harmful to people. That is, until a serious food poisoning accident in a Japanese food factory in 1968 shed new light on the chemicals. There was an accident where the PCBs actually leaked into the cooking oil. And when people ate food prepared with this cooking oil, they developed skin rashes, they developed tingling of the uh, fingertips and, and the toes. Um, and uh, in other words, it was a toxic exposure. Around 1,300 Japanese people were poisoned by PCB-infested cooking oil, contracting both serious skin and respiratory illnesses, as well as disturbances of vision. Contamination was also later traced in their children. Another consequence of this toxic exposure was that when women gave birth to children, the children were born uh, with certain abnormalities, uh, skin rashes, uh, early eruption of teeth. And uh, this was an indication that not only did the person who ate the cooking oil get damaged, but the fetus could be damaged if a pregnant woman ate this cooking oil. This accident in Japan is quite unique and cannot be compared to the PCB dosage people can get from nature. Nevertheless, soon there was increasing concern about the spread of PCB pollution. In the Great Lakes area bordering the US and Canada, signs of an increase in PCB pollution was also becoming evident. Wildlife biologists were finding uh, all kinds of problems among the wildlife around the Great Lakes, the fish, the birds, uh, the mammals and actually populations actually were extirpated. In other words, they disappeared. The animals were having trouble reproducing. Um, male birds were behaving like female birds, female, female pairing. The birds were not attending to their young when they did lay an egg. Um, now there were other organochlorine chemicals there as well. They found a lot of chlorinated pesticides and they began to find dioxin. 
But PCBs seem to be the one that they focused on because it was most frequently found. Even the world's largest manufacturers of PCB, Monsanto, began expressing concern in an internal memo in case consumers would be suing the company for not having issued warnings of its harmful effects. Monsanto also stated simultaneously that PCB problems not only affected the United States, Canada and parts of Europe, but that other areas of the world were also likely to be prone. 10 million pounds of PCBs end up in the environment every year. The chemicals concentrate in the tissues of fish from PCB polluted waters. People eat the fish and PCBs build up in their tissues too. There's reason for concern. University of Wisconsin researchers fed monkeys diets containing as little as half the maximum amount of PCBs currently allowed in fish for human consumption. The animals suffered serious effects, such as reproductive problems and miscarriages. There may be subtle effects, things that we cannot see, things that may manifest themselves 20 or 30 years hence, that may be a result of exposure to extremely low levels of PCBs. The uncertainties of using PCB were considerable, and in 1971, Sweden was the first country to ban it, followed six years later by the United States, who prohibited its production and usage in new products. The decision to require that manufacturers stop was really based on the fact that these substances were persistent. In the environment, PCBs have half-life of at least something like 20 to 30 years. And under certain circumstances in the environment, they don't degrade at all. They, they will remain for hundreds of years, if not forever. So the fact that a man-made chemical was accumulating both in sediments of rivers and streams and in soils, and particularly in wildlife and humans, was reason enough to mandate that its manufacture and use be stopped. In the late 1970s, American authorities conducted examinations of anglers in the Great Lakes area and found PCB levels to be 10 times higher than normal ostensibly because anglers and their families often ate the polluted fish they caught. Among the adult anglers, there were no immediate symptoms of poisoning, but authorities ordered another study, this time of babies whose mothers had high levels of PCB, and analyzed the link between PCB levels in the baby's umbilical cords and in their ability to learn. It's a test where um the baby looks at two identical photographs, and the examiner looks through a peephole to see is the baby really looking at the photograph. And after the baby has looked for 20 seconds, um, that's enough time for a normal baby to remember the first photograph. Then one of the photographs is switched. So now the baby is seeing the original photograph and another slightly different one. The normal response will be to look longer at the new photograph. If the baby looks longer at the new photograph, we know that they have encoded the old photograph, the original photograph, in memory. So we can see that their basic ability to encode information from visual stimuli is intact. What we found um, with the PCBs was that the children who were exposed to the highest levels of PCBs looked equal at the two photographs. They did not encode that initial photograph in short-term memory. By using this very refined test of visual recognition memory, we were able to see that their ability to process information was actually impaired by this exposure. And we were talking about levels of exposure that potentially anybody in the general population at that time could have been getting. Whoa, look at this. These studies aroused much concern. 
and authorities began to warn against eating fish, lest it be contaminated with PCB. Hello, I'm Patty Lowe. In this program, we will fish for the answers. Fishing is fun for the whole family, and fish is health food, high in protein, low in cholesterol and fat. Stop. Do you know that no matter where it was caught, sport fish may contain toxic chemicals? Because the levels in the, the fish that were being used for human consumption were at levels that clearly posed risk of accumulating in people, our federal agencies began to issue advisories since the mid-1980s, do not eat fish. These advisories continue to be in effect. Uh, for example, uh, in the Great Lakes, there's a general advisory that one should not eat fish from the Great Lakes. In the late 80s, Joseph Jacobson followed up on his earlier studies of the learning ability of these babies. The children's IQs were tested when they were four years old and again when they were 11. What we found was that the prenatal PCB exposure, which was at quite low levels, predicted uh, lower IQ scores. Uh, on the average, the, the most heavily exposed children had IQ scores about six and a half points lower than the other children in the cohort. Um, and what that told us is that this prenatal exposure had a very substantial long-term impact on cognitive function. Um, it was seen particularly on verbal abilities and particularly on reading comprehension. All right, let's go. Come on. All right, ready? Swing right For through. one individual, a five to seven point IQ decrement probably isn't so terribly significant. For society, this Good. is extremely significant. Shifting the IQ curve down in a population reduces your number of geniuses, increases your number of retarded people, and from a societal point of view is a dumbing down of the population. And uh, so, yes, it may not make an enormous difference for one individual, but in terms of productivity from society and the cost to society, this is a very, very major factor. And in my judgment, that probably is the most dangerous health outcome of the many from these, these compounds. Jacobson's findings attracted attention, but it's still unclear why extremely small doses of PCB could have a decisive influence on the development of a fetus. It was about 1988 when I pulled all this information together about the Great Lakes and, you know, the, the, all the wildlife information, and also pulled together this particular study. And we looked and we said, well, my goodness, it looks like we have chemicals here that are not affecting the adult animals, but their offspring. The endocrine system, or the hormonal system that controls development, kicks in the minute the sperm enters the egg, and the cells begin to split. And the first neuronal cells in the brain, these are the little nerve cells that develop, can be affected by these chemicals. There are studies that looked at PCBs in mothers of children, and these children had uh, temperament problems, learning problems, and memory problems. So, my goodness, we've been testing chemicals to see if they cause cancer on adult animals. We've been testing them on adult animals to see if they cause convulsions, see if they cause skin and eye irritation, and also to look to see if they cause mutations. And if they didn't cause those effects, we thought they were safe. By the late 80s, there was an increasing awareness that PCB accumulated in the fatty tissue of carnivorous mammals. And in Canada, it was noted that whales near the St. Lawrence had such high concentrations of PCB and other chemicals that in fact, they should be classified as toxic waste. 
Mammals in the Arctic region also had high PCB levels, but to what extent the pollution had affected people in the Arctic areas was still unknown. But then, by chance, one of Joseph Jacobson's colleagues showed an interest in conducting further investigations. He had originally gone up to the Arctic because he was interested in problems of lead exposure in children. And, and he thought the Inuit would be an excellent control group because they live in a pristine environment. And he learned by doing some blood tests on the children that uh, the population of Inuit in the Arctic are very heavily exposed uh, not only to lead but also to PCBs and methylmercury. And this was a, a surprise to everybody. The Canadian authorities decided to investigate PCB pollution in more detail and chose Broughton Island, 800 kilometers north of the Polar Circle. Here, the island's 450 inhabitants eat traditional foods such as seals, which are among some of the most contaminated of species. The results of the study were shocking. For industrial accidents aside, the inhabitants showed the highest ever recorded concentrations of PCB. Two out of three children on Broughton Island had concentrations of PCB well over and above any acceptable level. From that report, uh, people were, uh, especially younger generation, were very affected. They, they even want to stop eating country food that, that was involved, that, that, that had a blubber in it. It was said that the Inuit people from neighboring areas would no longer marry inhabitants from Broughton Island. They called them the PCB people. Yet further studies showed that Inuit people around Arctic Canada and Greenland all had high concentrations of PCB, up to seven times the level of people in Europe and the US. It's an absolute tragedy. And this is uh, one of the best examples of environmental injustice because these people have had none of the benefits. They live in an environment where they must be dependent on local sources of food and those of us in the industrial world have contaminated those food sources. The pollution of the Arctic areas, not just with PCB, but also other hazardous industrial chemicals and crop sprays, was deemed unacceptable by the international community, and by the 1990s, the UN's environment program, UNEP, placed the matter high on its agenda. In Bonn, Geneva and Stockholm, at the one conference after another, discussion finally led to a convention which banned outright 12 of the most harmful chemicals, including PCB. And in 2003, this convention was signed by 127 countries. It's going to be a model for a, a, our working globally to deal with chemicals, because the chemicals that are getting to us are the ones that are produced in extremely high volumes that are integrated into the products that we're bringing into our homes. These are the ones we're concerned about. In our schools, in our buildings, our automobiles, everywhere we go, we're exposed to these things. And every other country in the world wants these same wonderful pieces of modern technology that have these chemicals in. So unless we address this on a global scale, we're not gonna solve the problem. Although the production of PCB has finally been stopped, PCB is still present in thousands of electrical installations, buildings and in the environment. One of the many places where PCB is still found in great quantities is the Hudson River on the east coast of America. And not surprisingly, for up until 1977, General Electric's alone had released just under 1,000 tons directly into the river. So now we have 200 miles of the Hudson River from Hudson Falls to Manhattan that is contaminated and is on our national priority list of most contaminated sites that pose risks to human health. Our EPA has recently 
determined that the most contaminated parts of the Hudson River will be dredged. That is, that the contaminated sediments will be dug up and removed from the river. However, what do we do with these contaminated sediments? At the moment, the only mechanism that we have that's recommended by the EPA for destroying PCBs in sediments is to incinerate them, which is outrageously expensive. And in fact, this is not a realistic way of getting rid of the PCBs. So what is expected to be done with the dredged material from the Hudson River is to put it in a secure landfill. The total expense of removing PCBs from contaminated mud in the Hudson is estimated to be $460 million. And despite great effort, it's still unclear whether fish will ever be safe to eat. But PCB is not only to be found in our environment, it's inside each and every one of us. And through childbirth, is passed down by us to future generations. In June of 2004, during an international conference, the World Wildlife Fund took blood samples from 13 European ministers for the environment. Their blood was tested for 77 different chemicals. New substances, for instance, such as softeners and bromated flame retardants, as well as previously banned substances like DDT and PCB. The tests found 55 chemicals in their blood, with the most common chemical group being PCB, and no less than 22 different kinds of PCB. A World Wildlife Fund follow-up showed that women who have given birth have a significantly lower concentration of PCB, simply because the more children they have, the more PCB they've involuntarily passed on to them during pregnancy and breastfeeding. We've let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, and it's difficult to put it back. There are many chemicals that are harmful to people, but at least when we stop using them, we stop uh, the exposures. Unfortunately, with these compounds, because of their persistence, you can't stop the exposure just because we don't manufacture them any longer. Can you withstand all of these? Even today, we don't have one assay to test a chemical for how it affects the construction of our children from conception to birth. You find something that makes a great plastic. Wow, this is terrific. We'll test it for cancer. Doesn't cause cancer. We know that's not enough. We have to test for now what happens from the day the sperm enters the egg until that individual is born or hatched, whether it's a human, a laboratory animal, or wildlife. And we do not have that.